Moses stands before the people and gives them the ten words, the ten commandments, and says, here is a life-transforming choice you have to make as a people and as individuals. Are you going to choose life or are you going to choose death? The Ten Commandments are at the core of a godly way of life throughout the centuries. Now, these commandments are not in vogue today and probably have never really been in vogue all that much. But we have the first three. You know, the dealing with our relationships with God. I am the Lord your God. You won't have any strange gods before me. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Keep holy the Lord's day. A godly way of life, of reaction to the world around us. And taking time out for God and reverencing how we speak about God. And in the process, discovering that we are God's children. Once you've taken those off the table, the other commandments are greatly weakened, starting with honor your father and mother, the whole family structure. If we can't honor God, how are we going to honor other people that deserve to be honored? Now, we know, unlike God, parents are human, filled with flaws. And some parents are downright despicable because they've abandoned any sense of God in their own life and have embraced the way of evil. But on the whole, there should be that respect built up in family based on the divine truths. Now, a lot of people say, well, this is all religion. You shouldn't be blind sheep following uh, these commandments or the teachings of the church or the lives of the saints. Think for yourself. Most people that say, think for yourself, really mean, think just the way I do, and then you'll be free. And if you don't think the way I do, then you have to be really stupid, uneducated, uh, or totally misguided. And somebody will say, well, I'm 33 years old. I know what life's about. I can make up my own mind what's right and wrong. Well, the commandments are 3,300 years old and have stood the test of time in one culture after another, in one circumstance after another, over and over again. So you have our few years of human experience over against this divine revelation. What should be more weighty? And in the families, if they're godly families, they try to pass on the wisdom of God from one generation to the next. Honor your father and mother. Important, but it's also important that the father and mother live honorable lives. Now, I don't often give romantic advice to people, but sometimes when I'm addressing a group of young women, I would tell them, if you want a simple question to ask a fellow, to find out if he is marriageable material or somebody you want to uh, spend time getting to know, ask this simple question. What was your mom like? And if all of a sudden they come up with a whole list of events, oh, she drove me crazy, she was no good, she was this, she was that, she was the other thing, I think it's time to look for somebody else. Why? Because he's always going to be dealing with mom issues and women issues, and he's going to look for a wife that's going to be the perfect mom that he never had, and he's going to be resentful to the mom he did have. And that's pretty complex. For guys, I don't know what to tell them. <laughs> but that sense of honor in family, that sense of dignity in family, so important. 
And the whole notion of family being redefined, thrown out, uh, changed around, has a lot of implications. And so it is with all the rest of the commandments. Once God has been taken off the table, thou shalt not kill, that becomes problematical. Widespread ex acceptance of abortion, a growing acceptance of euthanasia uh, around the world, political despots eliminating uh, their opposition by force all becomes quite common. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery. All these things become weakened and be the human heart that should have the Ten Commandments engraved indelibly on them uh, become more and more stony heart. Moses said, have a cheat sheet on your wrist. Have these written on your heart, but also have them written down there. Oh, this girl's pretty cute, but oh, I see here, thou shalt not commit adultery, <laughs> a reminder. And it should be written on your face. You should look like a godly person, a person who's not going to lie, to cheat, to steal, to covet. This is a way of life. The other way leads to death even while people are still alive physically. And so the Ten Commandments, extremely important in forming the conscience of humanity. Now St. Paul tells us in his classic selection from Romans today that we can't earn our way to heaven. Try as we might, we're going to fall short of following the laws of God. We are going to sin, but we can look to Christ for forgiveness, which is another big problem the world has that has taken God off the board. There's an old saying that before we sin, the devil is a great excuser. Oh, go ahead. You deserve it. Nobody will be hurt. Everybody else is doing it. In a hundred years, who's going to care about it? But then as soon as we sin, the devil becomes the great accuser. You're no good. You're rotten. You're slime. You're not deserving of anything. Might as well continue wallowing in the mire. The church, on the other hand, says, you're a child of God. You could follow a godly path. If you do fall, you can return to God asking for forgiveness because his forgiveness is there. Whatever your sins might be, whether they're white lies or sins against humanity, you could go before a priest and hear the words, I absolve you from your sins. Not because the priest is perfect, not because the priest is God, but the priest stands there in the person of Christ and his power on the cross bringing that forgiveness there and giving you new life, new hope, a new capacity to live with a sense of peace and joy. And then we come today, today's gospel reading, which is coming to the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. And as the Sermon on the Mount comes towards its end, we see that challenge for preachers and teachers of religion who will stand before the Lord and say, we did all types of great things for you. We drove out demons. We prophesied in your name. The Lord will say, oh, I'm sorry, who are you? <laughs> I don't seem to remember you. Just having intellectual knowledge of the faith is not enough. We have to act on it. We have to forgive others. We have to reach out for the stranger, the weak, the widow, the orphan, the poor. We have to be able to forgive those who don't even want our forgiveness and hate us. And then the Lord says, ah, I see in your behavior, in your hearts, as well as your minds, that you are one of my disciples. The Lord who can judge what no one else can judge will then say, welcome into my kingdom, my good and faithful servant. That's the type of life we want to lead. Now you notice there's the tension between the faith in St. Paul, who tells us our actions can't save us, 
and the Sermon on the Mount that says, you better well act if you've been given the grace of faith. And we live in between those two tensions. And it forms our hearts, our minds, and souls and saves us from our worst selves. We become people of virtue rather than people of vice. Now, I want all of you to think for yourselves, but think with the church. And to think about God and how God is acting in your life. In a few moments that we spend together on a Sunday, thinking about life and death, sin and salvation, love and hate, we try to rewrite on our hearts what's right and wrong. And people still, despite everything, know it in their heart of hearts. About 15 years ago, they did a survey of juvenile delinquents in prison asking them what they thought right and wrong was. And then they had the same survey given to people, to teenagers who had never been in trouble with the law, except the survey said, what do you think those juvenile delinquents think? Well, the teenagers that had never been in trouble with the law thought, that, well, they must think that robbery, violence, stealing, and rape is good because that's the way they acted. But no, when they conducted the survey with the prisoners, they all wrote down stealing was wrong, violence was wrong, rape was wrong. They knew what was right and wrong, but for whatever reasons in their lives, they chose to go down the path of darkness. Let's pray by the grace of God that we and those we love will follow the path of life.